Hello, I'm Earl Weinberg, and this is Book Circle Presents The Cavalry Cycle. Aftermath. Mr. Donovan. Sir, how did you enjoy your first leave to town? Oh, fine, sir. Very interested. I thought so, too, since I did not, in fact, see any of you around town. And I went by the stable where Mr. Vimont keeps his mare and found her missing. So you went through with your plan? Yes, sir. Worked very well, sir. We didn't have any packs handy to load on Zelda, but she's a nice little thing and easy for Vimont to lead. He genuinely likes her, sir. I'm sure. And everyone turned up at afternoon classes, all correct, so that's good. Yes, sir. Except for some scratches and contusions on Mr. Darcy and Vimont, who were naked. Well, yes, sir, but that's good, really. You don't have to worry about the duel any longer. Tell me about it. Yes, sir. Well, there were already four of us on the little expedition to Offham Wood, not counting Zelda. Should we count Zelda now, sir, seeing as we're so much closer to her, as you might say? Not in this case, I think. Go on. Yes, sir. Well, there were Darcy and I with Vimont and Zelda trying out the Leden, and as I said, Corliss wanted to have a look around the wood, so that was four, and little John's wife was busy in her training, so he said he'd just as soon come with us, so there were all five of us. Well, Zelda seemed to enjoy herself no end. Must make a nice change not having to carry anything. And Vimont's quite good with her. Yes, the three of you are going to leave poor Corliss and Little John in the dust in horse care class. Nice time poking around the trails? Indeed, sir. Until? Well, there wasn't exactly an until, sir. Corliss met two fays and made introductions, and time was getting on, and we'd all been getting on with each other. So Darcy just up and said, Vimont, we can forget that duel if you like. But Vimont got this uneasy look and took to shifting around on his hooves, and he said he didn't have any quarrel with Darcy now and was sorry he'd given offense, but he wasn't sure it was completely gentlemanly to back out. Fletcher sighs. Yes, sir. So Darcy says we have everybody we need here with the seconds and Corliss to ref, so if it would make Vimont feel better, we could have a little friendly Spartan right now and honor would be satisfied. That may have been clever. I'll tell him you said so, sir. So we find a little clearing with two paths cross and everybody gets in position and suddenly we find the trees are full of petty fays watching and cheering. One little lady all in dandelion down tells them to take off their shirts so as not to get them torn. Very insistent, I thought. Blonde, not so stick-like as many of them. Yes, sir. That's Lathwin. She likes to see some good muscle. And she can appear as a full-sized woman when she wants. Just a friendly warning, a... Uh, date with her can have mixed results. Thank you, sir. I'll pass that along. Well, our two heroes start rearing and waving their forelegs at each other, and the scratches, sir, are because they both fell over into the bushes. Then Vimont tries to get in range by hopping on his hind legs while he's rearing, so he falls over again and knocks the wind out of himself. And Darcy comes over to give him a hand up, but Vimont is still thrashing away in the scrub, sir, and doesn't see him. And that's when Darcy got kicked in the horse chest? Indeed, sir. Well, Vimont scrambles up and falls all over himself verbally this time, apologizing, and neither of them notice until later that when Darcy was hit, he lashed out reflexively and got Vimont in the horse ribs. Actually, it was Little John pointed it out. So then Corliss plays the referee and pronounces honor satisfied in a very convincing voice, sir, when he stops laughing. And about then we notice the shirts are missing. Lady Lathwin's work, I now suppose. So our heroes wander about a bit, tried some pleading and grousing, and then give it up. And Corliss has his hands full with Zelda, who was not happy about seeing her stallion fighting and wanted to leave. He should have handed her over to Vimont. So he did, sir, when Vimont got back from looking for his shirt. We'd have gone home then, but little John was busy with the woods phase. They'd been betting on the match and had given him the kitty to hold. Not Corliss, the ref. Corliss didn't want anything to do with it, sir. He said so, though very politely. And one of them said Little John was the most honest of us anyway. I'm not sure if I'm insulted about that. Anyway, Little John was counting out little gilded leaves while the Fays were arguing which particular leaf was whose, until finally his phone gives the squeak for five-minute warning. So we say we have to go, and Little John jumps, dumps the leaves on the ground among them and tells them to just be honest, and then we put in some gallivant practice to get to class in time, sir. Very nice. Well done all. 
Did either of our heroes stop by the pub on the way to pick up Zelda or to go to the wood? No, sir. All the above was entirely unaided by alcohol. Remarkable. A technical question, sir. What are we supposed to do with our arms in a fight like that? They both had their fists clenched, but they weren't doing anything with them. If you must go rearing about, the best use of your hands is to hold a pole arm or a club of some kind if you can get one. But it's perfectly reasonable to stay on all fours and wade in fists first. That's the approved method for bar fights because of the low ceilings. Of course, hooves alone were the terms of the duel. Thank you, sir. How did you get Zelda back home? We swung past the base stable and parked you in an empty stall for a bit, sir. Turned around and there's the brownie demanding to know what we think we're doing. I explain and Vimont pleads and the brownie nods, but I think Vimont may owe him one now. She was gone after class, which put Vimont in a tizzy until I called the stable and learned she was back as if she'd never left. Yes, I think Vimont owes Eowick. Tell Vimont he likes hot cream and bourbon. Vimont can invite him down to the bow and saber next time he's free. Thank you, sir. And we have plenty of t-shirts, but if you want them back, ask Eowick about that, too. He'll get them from Lathwin when she's done sniffing them. Sniffing, sir? I think maybe we'll just forget about the shirts, sir. In fact, maybe the whole incident is best forgotten. Oh, I wouldn't say that. And now? Bonfire night. Only one road leads to the little Berkshire town of Uffham, and the turnoff for it is hard to find unless you're sundered. It becomes the main street, though, without acquiring any pavement, running straight south to the north until it terminates before the athletic field of the cavalry base. On either side, Uffham spreads out in wandering lanes. The road itself is broad. They like to do things spaciously in Uffham. The little car, bright yellow, puttered along carefully. The early November evening was closing in, but the road was still crowded one or two lorries and a few bicycles, but mostly foot traffic, human and hoofed. Not all the hoofed traffic was horses, or not horses simple, as the locals put it. The driver slowed further and goggled at the variety of pedestrians, but then looked around for a place to park. There were no parking spaces marked, and as mentioned, no pavement to mark them on. He pulled up beside a water trough, but before he could turn off the engine, someone rapped on the car roof. Leaning over to peer out of the passenger window, he saw one of the unsimple horses. The man's face was framed by a cowboy hat and a flowing beard. The beard spread over the chest of a brown t-shirt, below which stood the body of a brown horse with black legs and tail. Bay, did they call that? Excuse me, sir, the centaur said. That might be wanted. He waved at the water trough. Horse trough, specifically. If you would, please pull up a few feet and park in front of that store window. Oh, said the driver. I see. Thank you. He pulled up and got out. The centaur had paced along. Sorry about that, he said to the driver. There are actually plenty of parking spaces here, but I'm afraid we locate them by memory. He smiled and extended a hand down to the human. Welcome to Uffham. Cavalryman Jason Fontaine at your service. Sorry to nag. Of course, in a little sundered place like this, he was instantly known as a stranger. The driver didn't even think about it. Instead, he shook the proffered hand and said, not at all, thank you, Bart Coy. He gave a habitual smile, then reflexively pulled a business card out with his free hand and passed it to Fontaine. Do you know where I could find Roland Vimont? He's uh, one of you, dedicated cavalry. Vimont, don't place the name, is he new? Coy nodded joined this summer. Ah, then he'll still be in training. You could ask Captain Fletcher. He's the teacher. He might still be in his office. It's over there in those buildings just east of the field. Only everyone's out and about tonight. Still, Fletcher might know. He quirked a brief smile. Knows a lot. Or you could look around for some youngsters up on hooves. It's likely to be your friend's classmates. Thank you. The Bay Pony soldier glanced at the business card. Bartholomew Coy, catered entertainments for sundry and all. You're here for bonfire night, Fontaine asked. Yes, doing a gig over at Whiffburn Hill. Hope to see you there. Forta Fontaine smiled again, gave a casual salute, but no commitment, and faded into the evening at an easy trot. 
Most people relax when a stranger leaves, especially if it's a very strange stranger. Coy tensed up and looked worried. An onlooker would have seen that the relaxed manner had been a pose. Coy was a slender man in white slacks and dress shirt, protected from the chilly evening by a blue woolen dress jacket. His dark hair was curly and enough longer than the mode to be noticeable. Clearly a city man in the country. His face, now tight, was heart-shaped with big hazel eyes and avoided looking feminine by the carefully edged fashionable scruff. He pulled out a pen and another business card, wrote Vimont blackly on the back, and tucked it under the wiper of his car. It was a very long, long shot, but he had to take every chance of finding Vimont. Then he deliberately relaxed again and joined the foot traffic, looking for Vimont or anyone who might know Vimont. He reached into his jacket again and pulled out a little stick, an L-shaped piece of polished wood, and twiddled it by the short leg. As he twiddled, he looked around. A small country village at evening would, you might think, be very quiet. But evening was early and people still had things to do. And in any case, tonight was bonfire night, Guy Fawkes night. The issue of that event did not really concern Grand Normandy. It hadn't been their government under threat, but hey, any excuse for a party, right? Not so very many centaurs, but they stood out being so big. None appeared to be Vimont though. Where was the van? Ah, coming in just now. A small white van nosed carefully down the street through the buried pedestrians. The side of the van bore the same message as his business card, plus the silhouette of a boy child dancing and playing a pipe. Coy marched over and waved it to the storefront next down from his car, carefully away from the door. Timmy Tips and Caper got out, two young men in rock band t-shirts, hugely baggy pants, and baggy knitted berets. How's it going at the venue? He asked them. Fine, sir, said Timmy. The tables are all set up, but Corno said nothing but coffee and tea until you got back. Normally, Coy would have been overseeing everything. Right. This thing all emptied out? Yes, sir. They looked at the van, then to him. He had not told them why he wanted the va van emptied out, and he did not tell them now. Right. Got flyers? They nodded. Right, I'm going to find Roland Vimont. Got that? Roland Vimont. He's a centaur now. Here's what he looked like. He showed them the picture on his phone. Probably got a beard now, they all seem to. He glanced at their faces. Both Timmy and Caper wore goatees, neatly pointed and waxed, in preparation for tonight's performance. Ask around. Distribute the flyers as an excuse. He's an old friend of your boss, if people ask. But be discreet, Timmy asked. Coy started to say, of course, but paused and said, this time it's more important to just find him. Phone me as soon as you get anything. Now, he was in the act of giving a final look over to their appearance, which would he supposed have to do. He halted, spotting their bare feet. No shoes? It looked odd on a November night. None fit, sir, said Caper. They were dancers and of course fussy about such things and limping and losing shoes would have drawn attention too. Yes, it would just have to do. Coy nodded. Go, he said, making a shooing motion. They reached into the van, pulled out handfuls of flyers, and went. Coy went to the back of the van and opened the door. Yes, properly cleaned out. Even some packing blankets on the floor. He supposed it was big enough for a horse, if it knelt. He closed it up and headed for the end of the street, where, according to the friendly Mr. Fontaine, you could find Vimont's trainer, who might know where he was. He stared up at a couple of other centaurs he passed, who failed to be Vimont. He wondered how tall Vimont was now. He'd been blocky and burly before the change. Must be a regular plow horse now. The honorable plow horse. What a come down. Here was the racetrack. Now, where was the trainer's office? For that matter, where were Timmy and Caper? They probably weren't properly in the groove yet. Yes, there they were on the other side, trailing after a centaur with a rider. The creature was manifestly not Vimont. Coy could even tell at this distance and in this light. But the rider was a woman, which explained their distraction. He phoned them. What are you doing? He asked with weary patience they knew well. What you said, boss? Looking for a centaur? Named? Vermont? Vicomte Roland, Vimont. I'm sending you his picture. 
Try in that pub. They could certainly find a pub. Ask around. Vimont. Roland Vimont, a student. And you have no money, so you can't order drinks. Or they could, but it would end badly. What likelier than that this pub would have a thousand pound bouncer with brass knuckles, iron shoes, and a kick exactly like a mule's? You're passing out flyers, but he's my old friend, so you're asking around. That's the story. Right, boss? Yes, sir. And don't hang up. That way he could listen in on them from time to time. He sauntered his way down the street, pausing to look back and see Timmy and Caper vanish into the pub. Finally, he came to the athletic field. By stepping off the street onto the grass, he was officially entering the cavalry base, he supposed, but several other civilian looking people had done the same and were standing by the railing at the edge of the field. The dousing stick had led him here, but he wondered why. The field was brightly lit. An oval track of bare earth ran around the perimeter. It was presently occupied by six equines, some with riders. Four of the equines were centaurs, the other two were horses. Everybody was diligently clipping about the track, but they did not seem to be racing. He felt thudding in the earth and presence at his back. Turning, he saw a pair of centaurs. Both towered over him, of course, the bigger a bit over seven feet, the smaller a bit under. They gazed over his head at the runners. Are they practicing for something? Coy asked. For various things, the bigger one said. He was heavily built, his coat red-brown, his curly hair red, his beard redder. His companion was much more lightly built and black-haired. Both were in dress uniforms, vivid blue cowboy hats, red jackets with white piping, blue saddle blankets matching the hats with the royal coat of arms blazoned on each flank. The big centaur started pointing things out. The lone horse there is practicing following without a lead. See the pair trotting ahead of him? The pair were a man on the back of a centaur. The gal on the other horse is just exercising her, I think. The rest are putting themselves through their paces, literally. He flickered a smile. His accent was Irish. Do you know horse paces? Asked the black-coated one. He was Irish, too. Coy shook his head. There are a slew of them. Besides walk, trot, canter, gallop, there's a million ways to amble. Single foot, fox trot, raval, racken, paso fino, paso corto, paso largo. That fellow there is Tolton. Pretty fast, but very smooth. Good for moving wounded. But, the big red one said, smiling, right now they're practicing for a show this Christmas. A tolt looks very smart on a parade ground. Ah, do uh, you gentlemen uh, tolt? Coy asked. They laughed. Not us, said the red. We're trainees. I feel lucky when I go for a gallop and don't pull anything. Trainees. Bingo. Do you gentlemen know Roland Vimont? He's a trainee. He twirled the dousing stick triumphantly and tucked it away. The red nodded. We're classmates of his. Let me make introductions. This here, he said, gesturing to his fellow, is the Honorable Bennett Darcy, and I'm William Donovan. He then smiled and lifted brows, awaiting the reciprocal introduction. I'm Bart Coy, he said, and passed out two of his cards. Do you have any idea where Mr. Vimont might be? The two traded glances, then Darcy said, he usually visits Zelda for a bit when he starts free time. Zelda? His mare. Oh, right. He faintly recalled that Vimont had a horse. Then Vimont had so many things. The London flat, the cars, the motorbike. None of those could he use now. Nor, for that matter, he kept his horse? Darcy rolled his eyes. Donovan laughed and took a couple of paces, half turning his flank to Coy, at the same time spreading his arms wide to him. Look at me, the pose said. We like horses here, he proclaimed. Vimont too, and he could afford to bring her along, so he did. Darcy smiled. He didn't really think it through. He didn't really think it through. He was very downhearted the day he realized he couldn't ride her any longer. Yes, that sounded like Vimont's mental speed. So we've been helping him train her to packin' and haulage, light haulage. He takes her for walks and like that, he pointed at the track. You might have found him running around the track on a lead. Coy smiled back and shook his head. Vimont did not seem to have picked up any brains or lost any income. Both good. I see, I guess. And where might I find him and uh, Zelda? Darcy pointed back toward the pub. 
Zelda's at the bow and saber. They have a livery stable out back. We'll show you. He trotted off, Donovan following, then slowed to a walk to accommodate the human. Coy eyed his newfound guides, one an honorable, probably a baron's son, and the other didn't say he wasn't an on. Some were modest about it, but at least two sprigs of nobility in the trainee class. He'd always heard that both Grand Norman cavalries, dedicated and standard, ran to posh, and this bore it out. Both were also known as places where the nobility disposed of extraneous sons. Coy felt sure that was what had happened to Vimont. The fellow was eldest, but had a brother and one or two sisters, and if Daddy Vimont had a lick of sense, he'd rather see any of them inherit the title. And you don't inherit titles if you're not fully human. Problem solved. Coy wondered if the black centaur, this Honorable Bennett Darcy, had been thrown away. Didn't look it, moved with a jaunty prance, as did his big red friend, doing the gracious act, showing a stranger around. Of course, that could just be keeping up appearances. Speaking of appearances, why were they in dress uniform? Or dress jackets, anyway. He raised his voice to say, You gentlemen look very well turned out, smart on a parade ground, as you said, going to a bonfire night. Thank you, sir, said Darcy, looking back. Yes, sir, over at Whithburn Hill. He glanced at Coy's card and asked, And you, sir? He and his friend Donovan fell back a few paces, and Coy found himself bracketed by politely interested monsters. He smiled and nodded. Working night for me, though. Speaking of work, excuse me. He raised his phone and accelerated to get a couple of yards of privacy. It occurred to him that as the person being guided, he should have fallen back, but his tension had propelled him forward. In any case, it was clear they were headed for that pub. He heard clinking glass and many voices through the phone. Natural for a pub, but it meant they likely wouldn't hear him to call to them. He hit the app that made their phones vibrate, a bit of custom wear for attracting attention without noise. He'd often found it useful, but should he have saved the money? Too late now. Yes, sir. Yes, boss. I'm being shown where he is. I'm headed for the pub. Come out and meet me. I'm with a couple of pony soldiers. Everything okay, sir? Asked Timmy. Sunshine and lollipops, Coy answered flatly. Ah. He saw the two emerge from the pub and waved to them. They conver converged, casting glances at Darcy and Donovan. So their business, reflected Donovan, watching Timmy and Caper trail obediently behind Coy. To the left and down that alley, sir, he called. Then turn right to Darcy. What do you suppose his business is with Rollo? Rollo was Vimont. Maybe he owes his fellow money, suggested Darcy. I could see Rollo owing money to a professional party thrower. Not that he couldn't pay, he'd just have mislaid the bill. Donovan nodded with a shrug, agreeing to the possibility. But if those two are supposed to be his backup, they don't look tough enough. Maybe he's an outraged brother and they're his friends. Hmm, or servants, Dar Darcy amended, studying the expressions and body languages of the three men walking before them. Donovan chuckled. Oh, dearie dear, what if Rollo has offspring on the way and him no longer able to make the arrangement official? Centaurs were not allowed to marry. He can still acknowledge the child and support the mother, Darcy answered stiffly. Donovan nodded and shut up. He was not, in fact, an honorable, but his family had worked for Darcy's for generations, and the two had grown up together, considered themselves foster brothers, in fact. He and his friend were the creatures they were, in part because Darcy took family responsibilities so seriously. The Darcy's had lost a lot of money in the last generation, and one reason Ben had joined the dedicated cavalry was because it paid you very well for taking a permanent transformation and a vow of 14 years service. A third of Darcy's salary went to his family's debts. It would have been half, but his father had talked him down. Another reason was that Donovan's uncle Evan was already in the dedicated cavalry and was a very happy man horse. They had now gone down the alley at the side of the pub and rounded the corner. In keeping with the main street, the alley behind the pub was broad, a road of pounded earth. On their left was a thick, high hedge defending a lane of private dwellings. On their right was the livery stable end of the bow and saber, a wooden structure with two doorways leading into two rows of stalls. By now it was night, and the area was lit by a single lamp between the two doorways. 
the two centaurs caught up with Koi and his boys and steered them into the further doorway. Here's Zelda, said Darcy, nodding at a light gray horse in a stall two in front in from the door. She was looking with mild interest over the side of her stall into the next space. They didn't see Vimont. The happy noise of a pub on Guy Fawkes night did not quite cover the sound of a nearby male voice, muffled, talking and laughing. Vimont, called Donovan, is that you? There's a friend of yours here to see you. Donovan and party came up to a bay between stalls, just as a, the male voice stopped to be replaced with a growl in a female voice. The intruders came to a dead halt. Whoops, exclaimed Donovan. Darcy went crimson. The bay between the stalls was big enough for a horse to stand in and held trunks and cabinets for storing brushes, bits of tack, and other equestrian paraphernalia. At the moment, it also held a layer of straw with two blankets on it. The top blanket was in great agitation. There was no room to turn, but Donovan started to back. Ben boy, did you notice those fine bushes back there? He asked, laughing. What? Darcy started backing too. On departure, he grabbed Caper, who had been watching the tossing blanket calmly, but registered alarm as Darcy's hand closed on his shoulder. Bushes, let's take a look at the bushes. Tom Donovan grabbed Timmy. Bushes, right, Darcy addressed Coy. Mister, you, let's go. But there was no one to grab Coy. He stood there for a second, his mouth tight, then turned to face the opposite bay. A few seconds later, Darcy and Donovan were back in the alley where they released their captives. Coy came striding out a moment later. Conversation drifted after him. Why wait indeed? Sorry, Olive. Honestly, most nights it's dead quiet back there. Jacket. What? Hand me my jacket. Where's the other boot? Idiot. Sorry, not you. Well, yes, you, but I meant me for listening to you. Donovan stood by the hedge, but he was not studying the bushes. He was studying the faces of his companions. The two servants showed no shock or embarrassment, only some worry as they stared at Coy. Coy looked angry and worried, but not embarrassed, as if he were thinking very hard. Ben Darcy did look embarrassed, though he also wore a half grin. But as Donovan watched, the expression changed to curiosity. Donovan followed his friend's gaze. He was watching one of the servants adjust his baggy beret, knocked loose in the hasty retreat. He was just in time to see a long pointed ear slip under the hat. Donovan then noted the thin shirts, the baggy pants, the bare feet, and added them up. He glanced at Darcy, who was busy glancing back. Perhaps a little diversion was in order. Poor Vimont, exclaimed Donovan. It's traditional to hang a necktie on the doorknob in such situations, but unfortunately neither doorknobs nor neckties were available. You must understand that lowly trainees such as ourselves have very little privacy. Find in any in his ex exercise in ingenuity, and that's not a muscle Mr. Vimont is used to work in. He's game, though. Is this the fourth time or the fifth, Ben? Fifth that I know of. I hope the lady's not a civilian. It'll be okay if it's Nadine or Ella. Didn't sound like either of them. Timmy, he the errant beret, looked up at Donovan and said, I thought you weren't allowed to go after girls. Donovan smiled down at the small man. We aren't allowed to consummate. Not that it's in the cards anatomically, in any case, but they like to spell these things out. Consummate, echoed Timmy, looking to Coy. Coy supplied a one-syllable translation. But we're allowed to use our imaginations, Donovan went on, and there Vimont has exerted himself. I ought to go, muttered Coy, then to everyone, we ought to go. Quite right, said Darcy. But Coy turned and gazed at the stable door, clearly unwilling to leave. Darcy took a couple of steps, Donovan followed, but then it was too late to withdraw from the situation. A young woman came striding out of the stable, brunette, athletic, in the ruddy brown t-shirt and jacket and blue denim pants and stetson that were the standard cavalry duty uniform. The hat was a bit askew, the jacket was not yet buttoned, and she was fastening a small amulet around her neck. Coy noticed it in passing. It was probably for privacy against scrying, and the reason his dousing stick had pointed him to Darcy and Donovan rather than straight to Vimont. Behind her loomed Vimont. He was bearded now, as predicted, and naked. He looked in rather better shape than Coy remembered from the waist up. From the waist down, he was now a blocky beast, a light creamy brown, 
Perhaps he was in good shape there too, Coy wouldn't know. His tail and the wisps of feathering at his various feet were the slightly darker sandy brown of his head hair. He looked quite the plow horse Coy had expected to Coy's own eyes. He bore a wad of clothing and an apologetic expression. I am sorry, Olive. Oh, it's all right, she said, finishing the jacket buttons. No one's fault, really, but the mood is rather shattered. I'll see you about. She shifted her gaze to Darcy and Donovan, who came to attention, saluted crisply, and gave little stamps of their right rear hooves, which did duty for clicking the heels they no longer had. You gentlemen have business with Mr. Vimont? Actually, this gentleman does, Sergeant, Darcy indicated Coy. Coy started a bit. He'd been gazing at Vimont. It was something of a shock to see someone you knew, even slightly, so radically transformed. He was used to more minor transformations. I do apologize, he said to the sergeant, switching on the smile. He produced a card. I'm hosting a party over at Whiffburn tonight. Allow me to invite you. Sergeant Olive pocketed the card with a muttered thanks, but without any enthusiasm. She turned to go. Um, Olive, Vimont began. Uh, sergeant, he tried. Rollo, I think we all know the level of formality here, she said, turning back. What? He dropped all the clothes except for a jacket, rummaged in its pocket, and produced a small box. I thought a little holiday present, so the evening isn't a total, um... Olive took it doubtfully, flipped it open, and immediately returned it. Thank you, but no. The onlookers had seen something sparkly in the lamplight. Not good enough, he asked, abashed. Too good, she told him. Look, a beer at the pub, flowers, even a picnic is fine, but not things I could cash in. I have my honor. She looked up at Bymont's baffled face. You really don't understand, do you? Well, we'll go into it next time. There will be a next time because you're a nice cuddle and I think you've basically got a good heart. A nice pair of them. But not now with people standing around with their ears flapping. She cast a final glance at the five others in the alley, which Darcy and Donovan entirely failed to see because they were staring studiously in random directions. Ta, she departed. Bymont watched her forlornly, then turned to Darcy and Donovan. St. Martin's Crupper, fellows, could your timing have been any worse? A bit, a bit, said Donovan. I think ten minutes later would have been distinctly worse. But Rollo, how were we to know? The evening is young. Rollo's probably off to give Zelda her usual stroll. What else could we think? We are sorry. That sergeant is a good deal too good for you, Darcy added. If she does give you a second chance, take it. Nine out of ten women would just have shrieked and fled. You know that, do you? Bymont grumbled, though he did not seem disposed to raise the conversational temperature. Just my estimate, but what do you think? Bymont said nothing, but turned to Coy. Barty, what are you doing here? At this very moment, he added sourly. He bent over, plucked a t-shirt out of the pile of clothes, and started putting it on. Coy sprang into action. Very sorry about the timing, old fellow, but I came to tell you some good news. I'm hosting a spree over at Whiffburn. Yes, I heard, Vimont grumbled. He leaned down again and retrieved his utility belt. And Deirdre will be there, Coy grinned hugely. Vimont stared. Deirdre? From Avignon? Yes, she'll be delighted to see you. I assume you were planning on coming. Uh, yes, Vimont looked back at the stable. Later on. Excellent. Do you need a ride? I've got one ready. What? Oh, no, we're our own transport now. We just cut through the woods. The Fays don't mind, not tonight. We could escort you, if you like, much shorter. Coy's eyes flicked up the alley road to where treetops were just visible against the dark sky. Ah, uh, no, got to take the van back and the car. You will be coming, won't you? Deirdre will be counting on seeing you. Deprived of one treat, Bymont was perfectly happy to aim for the next. Oh, to be sure. He plucked his hat from the ground, leaving only the saddle blanket. Great, great. Well, see you in a bit, and good to see you again, old fella. You, uh, you look splendid uh, that way. Up on hooves, we say, Donovan told him. Right, thanks. Up on hooves. Anyway, give us about an hour to set up, then come on over any time. Don't miss it. See you. And he left, trailed by his two servants. When Coy was well out of earshot, Darcy turned to Vimont, who was doubled up buckling his saddle blanket, and asked, You know your friend is a fawn master, right? <clears throat> what? He straightened. Oh, yes. Livens up a party. Gives the poor buggers employment. 
Well, I'd best get my dress duds on. Walk over with me? Sure, said Darcy. Meet you at the path. Vimont started away. Hey, called a high voice from the stable. The caller stood in the middle of the doorway. It was a skinny figure, about two feet high. It had a squirrel-like face and tail and wore a t-shirt and jeans for a toddler, though these did not fit well. What about that straw and those blankets? It demanded of Vimont. He looked baffled. I thought you fellows tidied up that sort of thing. We look after the simple horses, not you lot. You lot need to learn to pick up after yourselves. Oh, uh, understood. Vimont dug in a pouch at his belt and produced a large coin. This once, could I ask you to do it? I'm in a bit of a hurry. He tossed it to the stable brownie, who caught it, sniffed a little scorn, but then turned away. Remember your glamour kerchief, Donovan called after Vimont as he left. And next time, we will find out what a glamour kerchief is and where they're going.